Hello everybody, welcome to the first video in our chapter 20 video lecture set. Um, chapter 20 covers the heart. Uh, remember we are in the middle of our cardiovascular system. You just should have covered chapter 19, which was covering the blood. Chapter 20 covers the heart, and then chapter 21 will be covering blood vessels and blood pressure and kind of regulating blood pressure and distribution of the blood. Um, and the heart is the pump. So the heart is what is responsible for pumping all of that blood around to all of the parts of your body. Um, and so we're going to first take a look at the anatomy of the heart, and then there's quite a few physiological components to understanding how the heart works. So those are each going to take their own video. So we're going to focus on just the anatomy of the heart first. However, before we jump into the actual parts and pieces of the heart, um, I wanted to talk about the circulation. So that's important to understand the names involved with the blood vessels, where the blood is going, because that's going to be really important um, for the function of the heart as well as for the um, blood vessels when we get to chapter 21. So we have um, two circuits listed here, but we actually have three that we're going to take a look at. So we have a pulmonary circuit, the systemic circuit, and the coronary circuit, which is just the heart circulation, which is not shown on this picture. So when we talk about um, these circuits, it's basically your heart is a double-sided pump. So we have one side that receives deoxygenated blood and sends it to the lungs, and then the other side receives the blood from the lungs and sends it out to the body. So it's like a two-sided pump. So the systemic circuit is the blood that is leaving your heart and going out to your body. Okay, so here they're just showing capillary beds um, in general, just capillary beds of the head, neck, and upper limbs, and then capillary beds of the trunk, abdominal pelvic cavity, and lower limbs. So it's very generalized. So those are part of the systemic circuit, okay, because they're going to your systems, your body systems. Then we have our um, pulmonary circuit here, which is blood supply just from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart, okay? All right, so that's the basics, basis for those two major um, circuits, the systemic circuit, the pulmonary circuit. The coronary circuit is just um, from the left side of the heart out to the heart muscle itself and back to the right side of the heart. So we'll see that in a little bit more detail. So I just wanted to mention it here even though we can't see it. When we take a look at the color code here, we have reds and blues. Now, red is indicative of what we call oxygenated blood, the blood that has high levels of oxygen in it. The blue color represents um, deoxygenated blood. And in reality, it's not completely void of oxygen, it just has less oxygen. It's only about 75% saturated compared to oxygenated blood, which is about 100% saturated. And I don't know, this could be a myth buster. <laughs> I'm busting a myth. We don't actually have blue blood. We see blue like in our, through our skin and stuff. Um, and that's more of the color of the vessel, the, just the tissue color of the, the tissue itself. The blood itself is not blue. Deoxygenated blood is more of a dark, dull, bricky red color well, oxygenated blood is a shiny, bright red color. So your blood is red, whether it's oxygenated or deoxygenated. It just has different shades of red depending on the level of oxygen. So we typically just use blue for deoxygenated blood um, because it's kind of what we see. I mean, so here I have a vein and you might be looking at your own veins and your hands and fingers and stuff. Um, but it's, it's a combination of the more purpley reddish deoxygenated blood and the tissue of the vein itself that gives it that bluish appearance. Um, now, horseshoe crabs have blue blood. There's a little tidbit of fact for you. Um, all right, so we have another, uh, some other words we need to understand. We have arteries, veins, and capillaries. Now, a lot of times, you can think of arteries as carrying the oxygenated blood, veins carrying the deoxygenated blood, and capillaries are the connector between the two halves. And for the most part, you'd be right. However, there are some few but very important exceptions to that classification. So I would rather have you learn arteries and veins and capillaries based on their the direction of their flow or what... Um, their relationship to the heart as opposed to what color of blood they are carrying. So arteries 
go away from the heart. Any blood vessel that's carrying blood away from the heart is called an artery, artery, no matter what kind of blood it has, whether it's oxygenated or, de or deoxygenated. Veins carry blood back to the heart and then capillaries connect the two sides. So when we take a look at the systemic circuit, yes, systemic arteries do carry oxygenated blood. That's your, I have this little thing that I usually do in class, I'm usually standing and I kind of make a dance out of it, but I can't do that on video. So if you start in the heart and you're sending blood away from your heart out to the body, right? This is our systemic circuit. This is arterial oxygenated blood going out to the body. Then we drop off the um, oxygen, pick up carbon dioxide, and then come back to the heart. So that's the systemic circuit from the heart out to the body and back to the heart. Then from there, we are going to take our arteries and go from our heart out to our lungs and back to our heart. So that's the pulmonary circuit. And take a look at what kind of blood is in the pulmonary arteries. It's deoxygenated, that low oxygen blood. So we have systemic circuit, oxygenated arteries, Systemic circuit, deoxygenated veins. Pulmonary circuit, deoxygenated arteries, dropping off CO2, picking up oxygen. Pulmonary circuit, deoxygenated blood back to the, um, oxygenated blood back to the heart, right? Okay, so we go out to the body, drop off the oxygen, pick up carbon dioxide, back to the heart. Out to the lungs, drop off CO2, pick up oxygen, back to the heart. Out to the body, back to the heart. Out to the lungs, back to the heart, right? So if you can remember this, because this is the double pump, we have one side that pumps out to the body and we have one side that pumps out to the lungs, okay? So systemic, pulmonary, systemic. And you'll notice every time we have to come back to the heart. So heart pumps out to the lungs, pumps out to the body, pumps out to the lungs, pumps out to the body. Arteries, veins, arteries, veins. So this is a really simple like hand gesture that might help you kind of remember this foundation of not only the circuits but also what kind of blood they're carrying and what is happening with the blood as it goes from the heart out to the lungs, back to the heart, from the heart out to the body, and back to the heart and where those arteries and veins are located. All right <clears throat> and then the capillaries are the change vessels in between. We're going to see a lot more about capillaries in chapter 21. All right, so let's jump into the anatomy. So the heart sits in your thoracic cavity. So hopefully you remember that from our body cavities way back in 231. It is kind of squished between our two lungs, sitting in its own um, serous cavity called the pericardial cavity. Um, and the lungs have their own cavity called pleural cavities. Again, you might remember some of that. Also, hopefully you'll remember in um, serous membranes that we have a visceral component and a parietal component. So if I'm going to draw my heart in a pericardial cavity, I can see that the membrane covering the surface of the heart is going to be called the visceral pericardium. And then the membrane that covers the wall of the heart is called the parietal pericardium. Okay, and then the space in between is called the pericardial space. So these pictures are kind of similar. They're showing you if you're to put a fist into a balloon, the balloon material that's around the surface of your fist would be the visceral pericardium, and then the outer wall or the outer layer of the balloon would be the parietal pericardium, and then the space is your pericardial cavity filled with pericardial fluid, which helps with um, friction reduction and ease of movement because your heart is pumping it kind of twists when it pumps so it's pumping and twisting within this cavity so you want the th nice thin um, visceral and parietal components of that serous membrane to rub up against each other with a little bit of fluid lubricant and that helps keep everything nice and efficient now if you were to have injury or infection or trauma to the pericardial membranes you could have something that's called pericarditis, which is the inflammation of those things. So you might have extra fluid being filled or friction rubbing, um, and that would decrease the efficiency of your heart, uh, which means it might not be able to fill efficiently enough or pump strong enough. Okay, um, the top of the heart, the su more superior part of the heart is actually called the base. Um, and it's, you can kind of think of it as like a triangle. So the base of the heart is up here and the apex is at the point of the heart. And that apex actually points kind of towards your 
oh, left. So it's going kind of sitting this way. So the apex points down here. It kind of points towards your left iliac crest, if that kind of gives you a directionality of how the heart fits in your chest. And then lastly, with this context, um, you might have heard that your heart is about the size of your fist, which is pretty accurate. Um, so you can imagine this pumping double pump, four chamber double pump is pumping about the size of your fist that fits right here in your um, pericardial cavity. All right, so taking a closer look at the heart, the pericardium and the wall of the heart. So again, we're identifying the parietal pericardium, which is attached to the wall of the pericardial cavity, and then the visceral pericardium, which is on the surface of the heart, both lined by simple squamous epithelium, which they call mesothelium. But I also wanted you to see, I kind of crossed it out, so it'll be a little bit more clear. So here's your visceral pericardium. It also has another name called the epicardium, because there's three layers of wall in the heart. We have the epicardium, which is the same thing as your visceral pericardium. We have what's called the myocardium, which is the bulk of the, it's basically the muscle wall. It's the cardiac muscle tissue that makes up the, the wall of the muscle. And then lastly, we have endocardium, which is basically just a little bit of areolar connective tissue lined by simple squamous called the endothelium and it is continuous with the endothelium that we find in blood vessels. So we have epi, myo, and endo are the three layers of the heart wall. Um, and just knowing that the epicardium is the same thing as a visceral pericardium. It's just two names for the same thing. And then also I wanted to point out in this diagram that the musculature around the atria, which are the upper two chambers, is wrapped almost in like a figure eight or an infinity symbol. Whereas the musculature of the ventricles kind of does this spirally twisty um, orientation. And that orientation of the muscle fibers is actually important because it increases the efficiency of contraction. We want our hearts to be a good, efficient pump, and having those arrangements of the muscle fibers themselves actually um, is a benefit for that efficiency. Okay, so we're going to take a look first at the superficial anatomy of the heart, and then we'll get to the internal anatomy of the heart. So in the notes, it kind of goes through the right atrium, right side of the heart, and the left side of the heart. So I will probably follow that path um, and identify these structures. But again, it's just anatomy. You will have plenty of time in lab to work through the diagrams. And we have some heart models, we'll do a heart dissection, but it is really important that you learn your parts and pieces first before we get too far into the physiology aspect. So please label your pictures, draw pictures of the heart, do what you can to understand the location and not get confused between left and right atrium and ventricles because we're gonna be talking a lot about those chambers in the physiology piece. So we're gonna start first with the right atrium. And I know the atrium is the actual chamber. So this label, right atrium, is actually referring to the hollow space inside. The atrium is the chamber, but this is where it would be. And the oracle is actually the flap of tissue that overlies that chamber. So in reality, um, this structure, the purple thing, is the right oracle sitting over the atrium. So atrium is a space. Okay. So then we have um, the right ventricle. So again, this is just the musculature, but imagine there'd be a hollow space inside here, and that's going to be the right ventricle. Um, and in between the atrium and the ventricle, we have what's called the coronary sulcus, sometimes called the coronary groove. So here's another picture on this backside, fat and vessels inside the coronary sulcus. We're going to find some coronary arteries and some other um, coronary circuit arteries kind of hanging out and embedded in that groove, that sulcus between the right atrium and the right ventricle. Okay. Some of the other structures here listed in the notes, um, I can't identify until we get to the internal view. So I'm just gonna skip over those until we get to them. So imagine right atrium, we've got an opening here. Right ventricle, there would be an opening here. The left atrium, again, here's the oracle, which is the flappy part but then the atrium would be like a little, the hole. So here, over here on the back side, you can kind of see a little bit more of the left atrium. And then you'd have a left ventricle is the space, again, underneath that um, muscle. And then another 
I, structure we can see on the anterior side is called the anterior intraventricular sulcus. Anterior because it's on the front, intraventricular because it's between the two ventricles, sulcus because it's like a groove. Okay. All right, so those are the major landmarks on the front of the heart. Um, so your left and right atrium with their little flappy auricles, the left and right ventricles, the coronary sulcus, the anterior intraventricular sulcus. On the back side, again, we can identify our atriums, our ventricles, our coronary sulcus, the posterior interventricular sulcus. Fat and blood vessels are located in there. Okay. So the, then there's these great vessels, these really large vessels that are um, coming out of and going into the heart. So starting with the right atrium, we have two large veins that drain blood into the heart. So this is going to be this. Right, so this path, it is a systemic circuit of veins going from your head, neck, and upper body, and your lower body, coming back from your capillary beds to the heart. And this blood in the veins coming back to your heart all drain into these two veins. One is called the superior vena cava, and one is called the inferior vena cava. So that is these guys right here. They kind of drain right into the right atrium. From there, the blood will get pumped out from the right ventricle. So if we're going to follow, I'll do a green, dark green arrow. So blood will come into the right atrium. It'll go into the right ventricle and it will go out the right ventricle going towards the <clears throat> lungs in your pulmonary artery. So here is that example of it is an artery because it's carrying blood away from the heart, but it's deoxygenated because it just came from the body, right? Vena cavus out to the lungs. It's away from the heart is your pulmonary artery. So when that blood goes out to the lungs, so again, here's your backside view, left and right pulmonary arteries, goes to the lungs, drops off CO2, picks up oxygen, comes back to the heart via your pulmonary veins. Okay, so now we're coming into, from the lungs, into the left atrium. So atriums are the receiving chambers, so they don't get a lot of, they don't make a lot of pressure, they're just receiving the blood either from the body or from the lungs. Okay? Then the blood goes from the right or the left atrium into the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle out to the aorta. Okay, so this is your from the heart out to your body. So now we're back to arterial art arteries, hmm. systemic arteries out to the rest of your body. And so your aorta is the largest of your arteries because it comes right off of the left ventricle and it has some really quick branches coming off of it. We have the brachiosphalic trunk your left common carotid and your left subclavian. This quickly splits into your right carotid, uh, common carotid and um, right subclavian, but they're not showing that split at this moment in time. So the three branches coming directly off of the art, um, aortic arch are the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid and the left subclavian artery, okay? All right, the one last thing I wanted to mention here is this little guy here it's called the ligamentum arteriosum that's going to come back when we take a look at our special circulations it is a remnant of fetal circulation so when you were in utero and you didn't have functioning lungs because you weren't born yet you weren't living in an, an air environment there was an actual shortcut between the pulmonary artery and the aorta when you are born, you don't need that shortcut anymore, and it just kind of turns fibrous, and this is the remnant. It's like a leftover of a non-functioning connector, and it's called the ligamentum arteriosum. All right, so those are the structures that we can see on the superficial picture. Looks like I kind of dumped Christmas colors all over it. Um, so let's take a look at some of these seen features and some new features, taking a look at inside um, the heart. Okay. So they've, uh, I use red and, or green arrows, but they're using the blue and the red arrows, but it kind of follows the same thing. So let's go through that same path, um, identifying the structures we just looked at and adding some new ones associated with each one of these chambers. So again, here's the right atrium, the little oracle flap. I won't draw everything. So it's just the right atrium. And here we can see our uh, deoxygenated blood coming in from our inferior and superior vena cava. Um, something that we didn't see in the superficial picture that we can see here is we have what's called the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus is the end of that coronary circuit. So the blood that goes from the 
heart to the heart back to the heart. So the heart's an organ. It needs its own circulation. All the blood that's going through the atrium and the ventricles, it cannot feed the heart muscles themselves. It has to go through the capillary bed. So there's little arteries that come off of the aorta. They feed into the capillary beds of the heart musculature. They drain into the veins of the musculature. And then those veins, just like your vena cava's, drain into the right atrium. And that's where the coronary sinus is going to drain into is in that right atrium. Okay, so from there, when your upper chambers, these atria contract, they squish the blood down into the lower chambers. This first valve flap, because we're going to talk about valves here in a little bit, is called the tricuspid or right AV valve. Okay, AV stands for atrioventricular because it's a valve that's separating the atria from the ventricles. So that's your right to AV valve or tricuspid. Either of those names are fine. It's tricuspid because there's three flaps, which kind of makes sense. These valves allow for a one-way flow from the atria into the ventricles, right? So you can think of like a trap door that only opens down. And when the ventricles are contracting, it cannot go back open. It doesn't flap back open to go up into the atria. That would be inefficient. So when the atria contract, the valve flaps down. Blood goes into the ventricle. When the ventricle contracts, contracts, these flaps close back up, and that prevents the blood from going back up into the atria and only allows it to go out the heart via either the pulmonary trunk or the aorta. So these are the jobs of the AV valves. These little flaps called chordae tendinae, they are what prevent those valve flaps from going back up and fluttering back up into the atria. So they are a structural break, if you will, um, to provide tension on that valve flaps. So it makes a really good one-way door. And then those chordae tendinae are connected to these little um, papillary muscles. Remember, papilla means bump. So we have these papillary muscles, um, and that helps to strengthen those chordae tendinae to keep the flaps of the valve flaps from going backwards. All right, so right atrium, through the right AV valve into the right ventricle. Right ventricle contracts, blood cannot go back up the atrium. So it has to leave out of the pulmonary artery, sometimes called pulmonary trunk. Either of those are fine. So pulmonary artery towards the lungs, right? So from the heart out to the lungs. There's another valve here called the pulmonary valve. Sometimes you might see pulmonary semilunar valve. I think they're dropping semilunar from the name. So this is a pulmonary valve and it's a one-way valve out of the ventricle. So blood going at these like these little cups. And when blood, when the ventricle contracts, they open this way, blood shoots up. And when the ventricle relaxes, it catches with blood and it closes these little flaps. So that's what we're seeing here. And you'll see that really nicely in the heart dissection. All right, so now blood is leaving the right ventricle out of your pulmonary trunk, left and right pulmonary arteries, because it's away from the heart, carrying this deoxygenated blood out to your lungs, drops off CO2, picks up oxygen. Now as we're heading back to the heart via your pulmonary veins. Oh, they're only showing left pulmonary veins in this picture, right? So here we're coming back to the heart. So that's this part of our little dance. Left atrium, left atrium down into the left ventricle. Now we bypass another valve. This is called the left AV valve, the bicuspid valve, or the mitral valve. I'll write this in here since it's not in the picture. So this valve has three names. Pick one. You don't need to know them all three. I just like learning left and right AV valves because it's quick, it's easy. You won't get mixed up between tri and bi and mitral. So the right AV valve is between the right atrium and the right ventricle. The left AV valve is between the left atrium and the left ventricle. That's the easiest way. That's how I learned it. Um, you also will see chordae tendinae and papillary muscles. All of that is going to be similar. When the left ventricle contracts, it's going to close that AV valve. It's going to go up, and you can't really see it on this picture, but there'll be another aortic valve, just like the pulmonary valve, one of these little guys that will open when the ventricle contracts and closes when the ventricle relaxes, and that's going to push the blood out into the aortic arch, which is then your systemic arterial flow. And then it goes out to the capillaries, drops off the CO2, picks up oxygen, and then brings it back to the right atrium, and there we go all over again. So we kind of did this path out to the lungs, and this path out to the body. So it's kind of interesting to imagine 
it is this, this sequential flow of right atrium, right ventricle out to the lungs, left atrium, left ventricle out to the body. But in reality, both sides of the heart are pumping and receiving blood at the same time. So you're receiving blood both from the body and the lungs simultaneously, atrium contract into the ventricles, the ventricles contract simultaneously, pumping blood out to the lungs and out to the body at the same time. So it's not sequential. But to explain it, I had to do one at a time. <laughs> so that's kind of where that came from. All right. So I think, let me double check on my notes to make sure I hit everything. I think we're going to go a little bit more into the valves. Um, let's see. Oh, one more thing. Uh, there's a couple more things, actually, that I'm seeing. So ana anatomically, we have the moderator band. We'll see this in our heart dissection, and it'll come back in our um, physiology of the EKG, the electrical conduction of the heart. It's like a little bypass of electrical tissue um, from the middle wall of the heart towards the right atrium. We have this structure called the trabeculae carnate, which is just the internal texture of your ventricles. So it's like a little network, trabeculae. We saw that back in our bone structure. Um, we also have the barrier between your left and right ventricles is called the interventricular septum. Um, and then lastly, we have pectinate muscles, which are the, the texture underneath the inside of the auricles. Again, we'll see all of these structures in lab, so it's really good to have your lab for the heart dissection will make so much more sense the better you are um, at recognizing these structures. So don't let the heart dissection be the first time you're learning heart anatomy because it just won't be quite as meaningful for you. Oh, there's a tiny little bit of the aortic valve. I just saw it right there, the aortic valve. Okay, let's take a closer look at the valves, shall we? All right, so I have some pictures over on the right-hand side. We'll talk about those uh, in a second, but let's go through um, these unique perspectives of the valves of the heart. So um, on the left hand side, they're showing just kind of a cut through, like we're moving the atria and we're looking down into the heart. So in the first picture here, we are seeing relaxed ventricles. So imagine the ventricles are open, they're relaxed, blood is coming in from your uh, vena cava is on the right hand side and your pulmonary veins on the left hand side, the blood's going into the atria but it's passive filling so the, those chamber or those valves are open and blood is just kind of pouring from the atria into the ventricles. So in a relaxed ventricle state, the AV valves are open. Okay, so you can see that right here, AV valves are open, but take a look at your aortic and pulmonary valves. They are closed. That's because blood just got pumped out of the ventricle out into either the aorta or the pulmonary trunk as and as the ventricles relax, those cups catch and close that blood. So that's what we can kind of see here in the side view. So blood is passively filling into the ventricles. AV valves are open. We do not want blood. We want to keep the blood from going back into the ventricles because we don't want those two bloods to mix. We don't want incoming blood and just pumped out blood to come back into the ventricle. So that's when the ventricles are relaxed. So now the ventricles are gonna contract. They're gonna start increasing pressure. And as they increase pressure, that pressure pushes the blood upwards because the contraction actually comes from the bottom like this. Mm -hmm. So as the blood is getting squished towards the top, it closes the AV valves and it generates enough pressure to open those semilunar valves. Okay, so again, looking at the top view over here, we can see that the AV valves are closed, right? So we can see the bicuspid and the tricuspid flaps a little bit easier in that view. But then your semilunar valves are open because blood is actively being pumped out of the heart. Okay. So the pictures that I have over here on the right, so this would be either the aorta or the pulmonary trunk kind of split down the middle and spread open. So these are the three little leaflets that are part of the semilunar valves and this is a gloved finger kind of reaching in and kind of pulling and lifting that little valve flap up um, i think that would be um, i'm going to guess the aorta because this looks like the coronary artery exit right out of the aorta now this guy right here we have a couple of valves we have one here i can't really tell which one but i'm guessing that would be the pulmonary and this is going to be the aortic valve so here's those three flaps now look at all of this stuff here i'm going to put it in green does that look normal no those are called vegetations this is evidence of a bacterial infection called endocarditis which is really 
dangerous. Um, the bacteria get into your heart in the endocardium, that inner lining, and cause infection and get bulky and get these big clumpies, the gross growths of bacteria and cell debris and waste products. And they cluster um, on the endocardium, but they also can find themselves onto the valve tissue. Um, it makes the valves inflexible and basically ruins them. So they have to go in and with really strong antibiotics, and they actually have to go in and kind of scrape those vegetations out um, and maintain high levels of intravenous antibiotics to prevent that from reinfection. Um, or if the valve damage is so severe, then the person might have to get a valve replacement, which they have um, organic replacements like from other organ organisms like pig valves are often used. But now there's a lot of mechanical uh, synthetic valves, which, which is usually like a little marble, like a ball bearing kind of structure that acts as the valve. So when the blood pressure goes up, the little ball bearing kind of lifts up and the blood can go around it. When the blood pressure goes down, it closes and that acts as the valve flap. All right. So those are the valves of the heart. Make sure you are comfortable on when those valves are open and closed based on contraction or relaxation of the atria and ventricles. We'll have more opportunity to practice that in lab as well as um, during some of the, the homework assignments. Okay. Now we're going to take a closer look at the coronary circulation. So this is the blood supply directly to the heart. So when the left ventricle contracts, so blood leaves through the pulmonary or the aortic valve up into the aorta before even the brachiocephalic, the carotid and the subclavian arteries up there at the aortic arch, we actually have two really early branches coming off of that aortic arch. We have, and these are called the coronary arteries. Um, we have the right, or the, sorry, the left coronary artery branching off towards the left side of the heart, and we have the right coronary artery branching off and going towards the right side of the heart. Makes sense? That's, those are easy names. The left coronary artery does not last for very long. It's just a short little, let me erase some of those marks. So it's just a short little span from about here to here. Then it splits. It splits into the anterior intraventricular artery and the circumflex artery. Circumflex travels in the coronary sulcus all the way around towards the back. Anterior intraventricular artery settles into that anterior intraventricular sulcus. Okay. And here we can see the circumflex artery on this posterior side coming around, and it will also branch into the marginal artery and some other smaller branches. On the right-hand side, um, the right coronary artery just stays right coronary artery. Um, it will also branch into a marginal artery on that side. And here's the rest of the marginal artery, which will come down and become the posterior interventricular artery. So that's the arterial flow. That is oxygenated blood directly from the left ventricle going to all the capillary beds to feed the musculature itself. Then through the capillary beds, it drains into the veins. And now we have all of these veins to bring the blood back to the right side of the heart. We have small cardiac vein, we have the great cardiac vein, and all of that drains into the coronary sinus right here at the back wall of the right atrium. So that opening that we saw in the internal view of the right atrium, that's what we're talking about. That's the, the flow of this deoxygenated blood from the right, uh, so from the capillaries of your heart muscle back into the cir general circulation. Great cardiac vein actually starts in the anterior ventricular groove, kind of works its way up and around. These two pictures on the bottom are micrographs of a healthy coronary artery and a not so healthy coronary artery, and you can probably figure out which one is which. So arteries, we're gonna be looking in the anatomy um, in chapter 21, but they have an external connective tissue layer they have a thick, smooth muscle layer right here, and then they have a little endothelium lining. So there's three layers um, of blood vessels. And it's wide open, which is great. That's what you want arteries because they're carrying oxygenated blood. Look at the opening of this coronary artery. That's pretty, pretty bad. And you can see the smooth muscle kind of out here, kind of this band. But all of this stuff here, my, my face picture is kind of blocking that kind of a key part to that, um, is calcified. So for whatever reason, there's been some calcification in the wall of this blood vessel, maybe some trauma, maybe some lipid buildup. But now instead of being a nice flexible tube, you have a big 
chunk of calcium salts in there and the opening is occluded by all of this excess buildup of, of gunk. So if you are trying to pump blood to your heart muscle and have your heart muscle get enough oxygen to function, it's gonna be a lot harder to go through that little opening. And when that completely closes off or gets so slow or gets so small that blood cannot efficiently get to the musculature, we have what's called a heart attack. Technical term is a myocardial infarction. And here are just some pictures of actual human hearts um, that have been dissected after the person died, obviously, um, of their heart attack. So what we can see here, there's these outlines of kind of this whitish tissue here. That is a location of a lack of blood flow. Those cells have died. And it's usually then surrounded by kind of a darker colored layer and then kind of the normal um, heart color. So the white and the dark views of this heart muscle tissue indicate that is where the heart basically starves to death because the lack of blood flow into that particular part of the musculature. And when you have dead heart muscle cells, they cannot contract. If your heart muscle cells can't contract, your heart muscle can't pump. And if your heart muscle can't pump, your body organs start to die very quickly. And so that's the lethality of uh, heart attacks is if your heart is so damaged that it cannot pump, the rest of your body pays the price and ultimately it could lead to death. So here we see a lot of the white all the way around the very outside edge. That's a lot of death of this, almost that whole ventricle. And then this white arrow is showing you there's actually a hole punctured. Um, the trauma was so great that the wall became fragile and there's a hole actually punctured in that. Down here, we have another death of the heart muscle tissue. It looks like part of the left ventricle and intraventricular septum uh, were, was dead. And then here, this is a preserved heart, so it doesn't look quite as shiny. Um, all of that's dead tissue. So these major heart attacks lead to death because your heart just cannot pump anymore. And so um, I think you have your article assignment this term deals with um, myocardial infarctions and cardiac enzyme measurements to tell um, to have evidence if a heart attack has occurred okay i know that was kind of a long video hopefully you took some pauses as you need to um so but that was a lot of anatomy and i wanted to make sure i covered all the anatomy in kind of one shot so the rest of the videos for this chapter are going to be covering cardiac physiology in three different segments we're going to do electrical activity and ekg um, the cardiac cycle and cardiodynamics. All right, so I'll see you next time. Bye.